Hello, everyone, and welcome to our webinar. Our topic today is titled, Wood as a Sustainable Building Material. My name is Karen Beebe, and I will serve as moderator for the session. I work for APA, the Engineered Wood Association. APA is a nonprofit trade association representing manufacturers of a variety of common structural engineered wood products. In addition to quality verification and product testing, APA conducts research to improve engineered wood construction systems and educates users and specifiers on the product's proper use and potential applications. Before we start today's webinar, I need to cover some housekeeping details. Katie's presentation will last about 50 minutes. To ensure that everyone can hear it clearly, we've muted all participants. We do encourage you to submit questions by typing them into the questions pane on the control panel on your screen. We should have time to answer most questions, but if we run short, we'll be sure to post a Q&A summary on our website, along with a recorded version of today's program. We should have that posted in a week or so. A PDF of the slides are available under the handout section of your dashboard. These will also be posted to the website in the near future. I'd also like to note that today's webinar is approved for AIA and ICC continuing education credits. About an hour after the conclusion of the webinar, an email will be sent to each attendee. It will include a link where you can get customized AIA and ICC certificates of completion. Our presenter today is Katherine Fernholtz. Katie is president of Dovetail Partners, a nonprofit environmental think tank based in Minneapolis, Minnesota. She is a forester by training with more than 20 years of experience with forest management concerns. She has worked throughout North America on efforts to address sustainability in land use and material choices. She serves in many leadership roles in the forest sector, including as a board member of the American Forest Foundation and on the Minnesota Forest Resources Council as a governor appointed environmental representative. For those of you just joining us, welcome to APA's webinar on the topic of wood as a sustainable building material. I will now turn the microphone over to our speaker, Katie Fernholtz. Thank you, Karen. And um, I'm very happy to be here um, and to talk with everybody. And uh, hopefully, for many of you, this is a topic you don't uh, you know, spend a lot of time on, but to talk about forests and wood and wood as a sustainable building material. So this presentation, we're going to address the environmental impacts of harvesting wood and answer many of the kind of basic, big, you know, broad questions around forests and forest products, such as what makes wood a green building material, where do trees and forests grow, you know, why is wood environmentally friendly, and how are these products sustainable? So some of the big picture. We only have an hour to cover the, the whole universe of forests. So we'll, uh, we'll cover as much as we can, but definitely looking at the big picture. So learning objectives, we're going to be looking at the ecological capacity of North America. So a lot of discussion today around ecology that gets at, you know, where the trees grow, where forests grow, those, that ecological uh, diversity within our forests. And also talking about the social dimensions of forests in terms of the relationship between forests and people. We'll be focusing on North America, on the U.S., but looking at that social dimension of forests. And then, of course, the economic dimension and how forest products and using forest products relates to being able to economically support sustainable forest management. And lastly, we've got to get into some of the numbers, the nitty-gritty quantification of environmental trade-offs, whether it's uh, looking at LCA or carbon accounting. So those are the kind of learning objectives and the areas that we'll cover. So for me, you know, I'm a forester by training. I've worked in forestry, as Karen mentioned, more than 20 years. And to talk about wood as a sustainable building material, yeah, I think, you know, that conversation start, starts by talking about forests. And forests are absolutely spectacular places. Forests are beautiful, magnificent, um, mysterious. They're just spectacular places. And they are absolutely essential to the health of our environment. They're also so important to our quality of life and it just social and cultural importance within our forests. And for me, this is me, and this is actually me on my honeymoon. So yes, I officially spend a lot of time in forests. But for me, forests and caring about forests is, is very personal. It is my profession. It is my career. Um, but I went into studying forestry and, and pursued a career in forestry because I think forests are special. And I really wanted to understand them better, make them a part of my life, and be part of caring for them. 
And so I hope that what I share with you today invites you into that deeper understanding of forests and really the responsibility that we all have in terms of understanding forests to the degree that we can be more effective in how we care for them and uh, ensure their future. So from that, those beautiful forestry pictures, we look at this picture. Um, and so just like, you know, talking about forest products means we have to start by talking about forests. Talking about forests in many ways means we have to talk about history and we have to talk about past actions and choices that have impacted the forests we have today. Because the reality, uh, I know this as a forester, we all know this, we can't undo history, we have to learn from it and, and take that history and inform the way that we behave today. And so we've all seen pictures like this. Um, these, this picture happens to be 19, in 1940 and in Washington state. Um, but depending on what part of the country you're from, I mean, this, this, this type of exploitation of forest resources happened throughout North America uh, for different reasons and at different times, whether we were building you know, the, uh, the ships of the British Navy and sending them our best wood, or we were using the wood from other parts of the country to, you know, win World War I and World War II. Uh, at different times in American history, we exploited the abundant forest resources of this country to, to build our markets, to build our railroads, build our cities, uh, build our economy. Um, and we had to learn some hard lessons from some of those choices. So, but we've seen pictures like this, and the natural question is, you know, what's really the impact of this? What is the impact when you harvest timber, or certainly when you do this kind of um, change in the landscape? Because as a forester, what I see in this picture, I don't necessarily refer to as harvesting timber, because this is completely different from the way we manage forests today. But at the end of the day, the question comes up, you know, what is the impact of these types of actions on the landscape? And how does the forest respond to that? And so, like I said, this picture is 1940 in Washington state. And this picture is, is five years later. And, you know, it's one of those things where um, what, we, what we know intuitively, but we don't always get to see it because we're not always in the same place from year to year. But what we know intuitively is that the forest and nature always respond. And that when an event happens, whether it's a timber harvest, or a wildfire, or windstorm, hurricane, tornado, when any of those events occur, nature responds. Those events have a, have a differing degree of impact depending on their intensity, but nature responds to that. And forests especially, um, the, the response within forests can be quite dramatic. Within five years, you see the young trees regrowing and reoccupying that site. And a few years later, you, you see this process continue. This is just 10 years after, after, that, initial, after that initial photo, just another five years later. And you start to really see the structure of that forest develop. What we talk about in ecology is both horizontal and vertical structure, because within those dimensions is where you start to see microhabitats or, or important niches for wildlife and for other benefits. So you start to see already at this point that vertical and horizontal structure developing. And then the most important thing for forest ecology, of course, is the creation of color photography. I'm kidding, I'm kidding. It just makes the pictures look a little bit more modern, but this is uh, 1971. And then this is the final picture in the series. Uh, 1974, so 34, pit, 34 years after that initial picture, and we have a very different situation in that landscape, um, and, and a forest that has, has created some complexity in just 34 years and really responded to that initial disturbance. And so I share these pictures um, for a whole bunch of reasons. One is I think it's so important to look at that resiliency within nature and to really start to ask ourselves questions about how do we interact with that resiliency? How do we support that? How do we learn from that resiliency and make it part of our sustainable behaviors? It's also important, I think, as a, a reminder of how much the landscape of America has changed um, over the recent decades. I mean, from that era of exploitation that really uh, peaked in the early 1900s and that um, has, it, that the landscape has really significantly changed since that time. When we look at American history, the low point for our forested area was in the 1920s. 
And today we have 40 million more acres of forest than we had in the 1920s. So we have more forest today in the United States than we had 100 years ago. And even in recent years, we've continued to expand our forest area. The last thing I would say about these pictures um, is that what these pictures illustrate is at the heart of how the forestry profession has changed in the last 100 years. From in the early days of American forestry and even forestry practice in, in other parts of the world, especially Europe, American forestry was very much informed by European forestry. But in the early days, the profession of forestry was really um, much more, the thinking was much more in an agricultural model where we focused on the productivity and how do you maximize uh, the growth and yield from our forests. What has really happened, especially in the last couple generations, I would say at least 40 years, is a, a real growing recognition, especially among foresters in North America, that um, the ecology and complexity of the North American forest provides us the opportunity to manage in a way that interacts with that complexity and the naturalness of our forest. In North America, most of our forest management, 70 to 90%, of our forest management, depending on what state you're in, but 70 to 90% of our forest management occurs in natural forests, not planted forests. That's very different than many other parts of the world where the majority of forest management and productive forestry occurs in planted forests. Within North America, our forest system interacts with this natural biodiversity and with natural forests, and that gives us the opportunity to, to work with the resiliency of nature that you see illustrated in these pictures. So like I said, we only have an hour to talk about a lot of forestry. At the end, I will give you a great resource where you can dig into more of this, but I always like to, to share these pictures with people so you can see that the history you might be familiar with, the black and white images you might be familiar with, um, that's not where the story of American forests end. So let's talk about the ecology of North America, why natural forests are so fundamental to our forest products and our resources, and why that's really an asset and makes what we do here just so fundamentally um, connected to sustainability goals. So many of us have seen these kinds of images of North America, satellite images, and we recognize intuitively that you know the different colors represent different ecological conditions or different environments across North America, whether we recognize mountains or deserts or, you know, lush green areas, but we recognize that as you travel across this continent, there are different environmental conditions. In the practice of ecology, we can take that information about the environment and we can classify that. We can, we can draw boundaries between those different environments and those different ecoregions, and that can inform the way that we care for uh, forests and other habitats within those regions. So this is a map of North America showing the different ecoregions, going all the way from you know the North Pole and the Arctic to some of the tropical wet forests that touch the southern tip of uh, Florida. But what you see as you go through these these different ecoregions is that the majority of this land area has the, the climate, the growing season, the available precipitation, all of the conditions that support forest growth. It, it covers much of this land area, not all of it, but much of it, there's the right you know, formula to support forest growth. And one of the things I, I think is important to understand is, is the difference between regions that can grow a tree or can grow forest. And the reality is you can grow a tree just about anywhere. You can have a tree in somebody's front yard and in the desert if they care for it enough. The joke I always share is, you know, you can have trees growing out of your rain gutters. You know, that doesn't mean that you're going to support a forest in your rain gutter. At least I, I hope not, unless you really engineered your roof. But the bottom line is there's a difference between regions where um, you can grow forests. And that's what this map really shows. And so in the eastern United States, all the way from Texas to Maine, from Florida to Minnesota, I'm here in Minneapolis, that's where I'm, I'm at right now. And yes, it's very cold today. But this whole eastern region is a temperate forest region, this eastern temperate forest. And so just if you imagine in your mind just how, how expansive that region is, from Maine to Texas, Minnesota to Florida, this entire region has the ecological formula, the, the moisture, the growing conditions, all of those kinds of things that are necessary to support a temperate forest region.
this dark green area throughout the Rocky Mountains, this is a Rocky Mountain Northwestern forest, a kind of mountain region. And again, at certain elevations and in certain conditions throughout this region, there are the conditions to support forests. But that's where you see that the distribution of forests, in large part, is, is defined by elevation conditions, moisture availability, those key factors. You get into the specific coastal forest, the west coast forest, the boreal forest that goes through the heart of Canada. All of these are our major forest regions within the US and Canada. Eastern forest, Rocky Mountain, Pacific coast, and boreal forest. There's other, there's chaparral habitats in Southern California, desert regions, Great Plain grassland regions. But these are our major areas that have the capacity to grow trees. And I just want you to, to take in those patterns for a minute, just that Eastern forest, Rocky Mountain, Pacific coast, and boreal forest regions, because these patterns emerge in many other things that you will see as we look at forests, because forests are heavily influenced by, e by ecology. So what we know is that those are the regions that historically, and, and still today, these boundaries hold pretty well today. With climate change, there are some estimates of this boundary of the eastern temperate forest creeping, uh, creeping west, that the moisture, available moisture, is starting to move west to some degree. And there's some, some changes potentially around this southern border of the boreal forest, but not, we're talking about 50 mile changes, not, we're not talking about entire states, that kind of thing. And, and, and there's, you know, there's some debate around the, the magnitude of those shifts as well. But bottom line, this is essentially the distribution of our forested regions uh, for North America. And so we look at, this is a map of where we have forests in the lower 48 today. And as you can see right off, this map closely fits with what you just saw on the previous map in terms of the ecological boundaries of where you would expect to see forests. We have forests from Texas to Maine, Florida to Minnesota, scattered through the Rocky Mountains and along the Pacific coast. And that's, it's a reminder that one of the first determinants of where we have forests is ecology. And where is the ecology and the environmental conditions suitable for growing forests? And that's what's reflected in this map. The other thing that's a little bit more subtle in this map, and I'll show it in the next slide as well, but is, um, well, why don't we have forests in all of those areas that have the ecology that can grow trees? I mean, there's a, there's a gap here, especially most evident here in terms of um, that, that Texas, the Maine, Florida, the Minnesota, isn't co covering quite as much land as what we saw on the previous map. And I'm sure many of you know that this is a region that is absolutely the breadbasket and a very important agricultural uh, region uh, for food production and all kinds of other uh, land uses in this country. And that is, it, it just helps illustrate the, the impact of economic and land use choices within where we have forests in this country. Because ecology and the environmental conditions are just one of the determining factors of where we have trees. But then beyond that, we have to make decisions in our land use. And so whether it's areas that have um, developed with urban development, and so forests have been cleared to create cities or development or agricultural expansion, those kinds of things. There's even uh, in the 1950s and mid-century, when we were developing our interstate highway system. That was one of the major drivers for land use change during that era. But as I mentioned, we have more forests in the United States today than we did, than we had 100 years ago. If um, on this ecological map, if all of the areas that could grow trees are growing trees, if we max out our ecological capacity to grow trees in what is now the United States, we have a maximum potential of about a billion acres of forest. That's about our maximum potential across all 50 states. About a billion acres of forest is our ecological capacity. Today in the United States, we have approximately 765 million acres of forest. 765 million acres of forest. Another way to think of that is over 70% of the land that have the ecological capacity to grow trees in the United States are growing trees in the United States. About 70% of our potential forest area is forest in the US. So I think that's an incredible you know, statement in terms of how we have valued 
forest land uses in this country throughout our history and that we continue to value them. Because the last thing I'd say on this map is those darkest green areas, the counties that are showed, shown in that very dark green color, those are counties that even since 1997, just in the recent history, since 1997, those counties have seen a 50% increase in the percentage of forest lands that they have. So even in our most recent generation, we continue to value forests and forest land uses across this country. More than 26 states are over 50% forested. So you can see Maine. Maine is over 90% forested. You get into areas like, um, I think, uh, in the West Coast, it's right around 50%. Many of these states, because ecologically, the eastern side of these states is, a, is not as conducive to growing forests. I mean, they still grow beautiful forests, but it's not quite as densely forested. And you get into many of the southern states that are 50, 60, 70% forested as well. So 26 of our states are over half forest land. I mentioned, you know, that importance of economics in terms of determining where we have forests. So ecology tells you where you can and cannot effectively grow forests, but economics really determine where we support the continuation of forest cover. And so this map is showing where our major sawmills are throughout the country. And again, you can see the pattern, the distribution of these business, businesses follows the pattern of where we have forests. It even follows the pattern of where we've seen more forests since 1997. So it, it's one of those things, I think it's, it's, it seems natural and instinctive to think that, you know, somehow cutting trees and forests don't mix well. But the reality is when there is an economic driver to support forests, we have more forests. And one of the major reasons that that economic feedback loop is so strong in the U.S., especially in the eastern U.S., is 60 percent, the majority of our forest land in this country is privately owned. And it's different depending on what part of the country you're in. In the eastern U.S., the vast majority of land is privately owned. West of the Mississippi, there is much more public and federal ownership. But as a nation as a whole, about 60% of our forest land is privately owned. And on an annual basis, about 90%, 89, 90% of our annual timber harvest removals come from private forest land. So there is a direct relationship between the harvesting of forest products, using forest products, having strong markets for forest products, and providing that economic incentive for private landowners to continue to grow trees. And if we look at the Southeast U.S., this is a part of the country where we've seen um, both forest industry growth in recent years, as well as expansion of forest areas. And if we think of American history, it's so important to recognize that one of the things that's happening in the Southeast is historically, this is a very agricultural region. There are different crops during American history that have been grown throughout that region. And what we're seeing in the modern era is that the, the dominant crop increasingly in many of those states are forests. And, and I mentioned before that most of our forest management in the United States is with natural forests and not planted forests. And even in the Southeast United States, only about a third of the forest is planted. We still have an abundance of natural diverse forests throughout that region. We do see intensive management within that region in large part because those forest land uses are on private property and they really do have to com compete with alternative land uses, including development for urbanization or even conversion to agricultural production and, and other types of uh, land uses that those private landowners could engage in. But it is exciting to see the level of expansion uh, that has happened in that region in recent years and the impact it's having on the landscape in terms of reforestation and forest expansion. So I mentioned a little bit that there are these differences between the eastern U.S. and the western U.S. and we see those differences of course in terms of American history, land use change, and all of that you know reflects into our the forests that we see today as well. And really, when you're east of the Mississippi and we look at the forest conditions we have and the history that got us to where we are today, much of that story is a story around agricultural land use and conversion of forests to agriculture, agricultural land uses for many generations, 
but then in more recent years, a transition away from annual cropping systems and a restoration of forests in many regions. There's exceptions to this. There's, there's many different dimensions to this story, depending on which state and where you're looking. But in general, when we look at the tensions around forest sustainability, it's a tension of land uses in the east, and it's a tension between agriculture and trees. So this is a, this is a set of pictures from Massachusetts. And on the left, you see this, this same landscape in the 1880s. And on the right, you see how it looks today in the 2000s. And the good news with this is that um, it's, it's coming back into forest, that we've had a time where there was a maximum of agricultural expansion, forests were cleared, there were cropping systems, pasture and grazing systems, but then as uh, population, an economy shifted and the agricultural economy really moved from the eastern U.S. more so into the Midwest. We saw private landowners and others within the eastern U.S. really favor the recovery of forests. That's the, that's the good news in terms of the amount of forest recovery there has been in the eastern U.S. The downside of this is that the forests that we have today are impacted by all of the things that happened in between. The forests in the east are almost all native species. They're, they're natural. They're, they're the species that naturally grow in those regions, but they may be in a disproportionate kind of distribution. One of the things we see in New England that's shown in this picture is an abundance of white pine. That white pine moved in pretty aggressively into some of these old fields. And so in the eastern U.S., there is this wonderful story of forest recovery following an era of agriculture. But the challenge for foresters and ecologists today in the east is to tend this forest, nurture this forest, and really help diversify and restore some of the health and vigor that we would have had. Because the soils have been compacted through grazing, they've been eroded through some farming practices. It, it just, it's a change system. And so much of the work in the eastern U.S. is restoration of a forest following an era of agriculture. Um, and it's, it's, it's exciting work, but it's definitely challenging work. And it is a reminder that you, you, you can't undo history. You have to move from here forward and work with what you have. But in the western U.S., it is a very different conversation in terms of forest ownership, forest conditions, and the challenges for forest management and restoration. In the east, much of the story can be circle around the, the understanding of the tension between forests and farms. In the West, the heart of the story that, that ecologists and foresters are, are working together to understand, the heart of that story is wildfire and really understanding what's changed in our landscape and the role of wildfire and how we're going to live with wildfire uh, in healthy ways. So these are pictures um, from Oregon. And this picture in the upper left is in 1909. And you see this person standing here by the tree and you see a, a pretty open forest landscape. I mean, it's a kind of forest you can walk through and have a picnic or, you know, whatever it is. It's, a, it's an open forest understory. And then you see this, this next picture in 1948. And this man, well, he didn't move very much. He's still standing, I'm kidding. He's, I'm sure, I hope he went home for many years, maybe this is his son, I don't know. But anyway, this is 1948, so many years later, but you see how the forest is starting to fill in. The trees are growing in this forest. And what happened between 08 and 1948 is we started suppressing fires much more aggressively in the West. And there were other things that changed during this time in terms of agricultural uh, practices, grazing, and ranching. Some of those behaviors were also starting to transition in the West. But the big thing that really started happening after the early 1900s and some of the major Western fires in that era is we really started to suppress fires. And you can see within the subsequent years, we get into 1958, 68, 78, and 1989. And by the time we get to 1989, you no longer see an open forest. You really see a thicket. You see it filled in with brush and young trees. Uh, and it, the habitat has completely changed. Whereas this forest condition in 1909 would be conducive to herd animals, maybe elk or deer or even cattle grazing. You know, this would be a, a, a habitat with uh, good uh, forage production for those types of wildlife species. By 1989, 
you know, this is good cover for prey species. I don't know, hares and things that want to be able to hide from their, from their predators, this kind of thing. So the habitat conditions uh, are dramatically different between these images. And also the wildfire risks are dramatically different. The forest that you see in 1909, if one of these trees was struck by lightning, that fire, you know, may crawl across the ground or it may burn a certain patch, but there's enough gaps between these trees, it'd be difficult to really support an intensive crown fire that would, you know, really um, you have a, a big impact or a high intensity. Not impossible because with wind conditions and everything, wildfires can behave pretty aggressively. But basically, this, this condition in 1909 is a much more fire resistant and fire resilient type of forest. Whereas the, the forest you see in 1989 has a much higher risk of uh, fire intensity where some of the younger, smaller trees would be ladder fuels that would, the fire would climb up those, those understory trees and be able to get into the canopies and potentially uh, carry a, across the landscape. So what we see out west is because of changing land use, especially fire suppression, the forest has changed and the wildfire risk has changed. And the challenge for ecologists and foresters today is to figure out a balance within these. Because the reality is that every one of these forest conditions, all six of these images, represent a type of natural forest. There's nothing wrong with any one of these forests. These are natural. This is the diversity of nature. Trees grow in different densities, different sizes. And that's, that's just the wonderful complexity of nature. You can have many different forests in any given place. The challenge for foresters, ecologists, and, and for other stakeholders is how much of each one can we support in the landscape? You know, how much can we support in terms of public safety? You know, and it, how much of each habitat do we want for certain wildlife or water quality considerations? And also how much can we support in terms of our active management and the way that we're going to interact with this forest to create more diverse conditions? Because in the absence of action, whether it's allowing for fire or doing harvesting, in the absence of action, the forest tends to look more like what we see in this picture F in 1989. And there really needs to be some active engagement with the forest if we're going to create some of the conditions that were more prevalent in the past. And so that's the challenge, is how much of each forest condition can we support, either for public safety reasons, wildlife, uh, you know, ecological reasons, and also for economic reasons in terms of what can we, we, can, we can support within our actions. So this wildfire question is really the big driver in terms of understanding uh, forest and forest sustainability in the Western United States. It also creates this incredible opportunity to really connect the dots of forest between the ecology and the economy and the uh, social impacts of forest and to really connect those dots even all the way through to some of the, um, the current issues that we have around carbon and climate change. And one thing I want to touch on, it, it, I, I, if you're following along in the handouts, I will warn you, these are two slides I added at the last minute, just because foresters like me love maps. Um, but I did, before I get into the carbon and climate change thing, the one thing I really wanted to touch on I, is to emphasize that wildfire in the United States is natural. It's part of our history. It can be very healthy for the forest. And it's something, like I said in the beginning, it's something we have to learn to live with rather than um, try to eliminate fire as part of our environment. And so this is a map that just shows across the lower 48 the historical natural fire regime and what we, we call return intervals in terms of historically fire, uh, you know, how frequently would it incur in the, occur in the landscape and how severe would it be. And these, these red colors, what you see, is these are infrequent fires. They might be once every 200 years or in that ballpark. Um, but they could be pretty severe. That's really what this is talking about is maybe infrequent fires, but when fires occur there, they can be very more severe than in other regions. Where you get into some of these areas of green and light green, and those are indicative of regions where you could have very frequent fires every few years, every few decades, but they would be lower intensity. Because over that period of time, you wouldn't have the same accumulation of fuels and those kinds of things. But we know all the way across this country 
that fire is part of the historical natural disturbance, it's part of our ecological function, and so we need to learn how to, how to work with that and manage for that responsibly. And as I mentioned in the, what we've seen in recent years though, with the change in our forest conditions, is an increase in wildfire risk and wildfire potential. And that really shows how, this map really shows how that risk, these red areas and orange areas are the high and very high wildfire risk potential. Right now in this country, that really is concentrated in the West. There are wildfire risks in other parts of the country as well, and we have seen devastating wildfires in other parts of the country, but there is a, there is a very significant challenge around wildfire hazards in the Western US. So let's talk a little bit about climate change, carbon, we'll get into LCA, um, and, and, and just kind of try and bring all of this together in terms of how these things connect. The ecology of our forests, that diversity across the country, the challenges we were faced with in terms of having to care for that forest resource and, and in, enhance its resiliency, and, and then the, the modern challenge of, of climate change and carbon storage. And so what's been well recognized is that forests have a significant role to play, the leading role to play in natural climate solutions. And that can be within reforestation, planting trees, you know, protecting forests, all kinds of roles that forests can play within uh, natural climate solutions. It's recognized that, that forests have a significant role and that's a very good thing. We also know that experts that have looked at climate change and the role of forests have recognized that that role is, is multifaceted. And this is such a core concept to wood as a sustainable material. Because the core thing that the experts have recognized is that really when we want to address climate change and carbon storage, we get to do multiple things to get the maximum benefit. And so really we can look at sustainable forest management strategies that are designed to maintain and increase storage of carbon in the forest, which means growing healthy forests, protecting forests from wildfire, but having carbon stored in the trees and in the forest, while also producing sustainable yields of timber, fiber, and products from the forest. Because those products can also store carbon and they can help us avoid using higher emitting materials. So this is it's a core part of wood as a sustainable material, understanding that for addressing issues like climate change or addressing sustainability goals that are multifaceted, we can, we can reach those goals and address those goals with things that we do in the forest and how we utilize materials from the forest within our economy and our built environment, that there is a circular opportunity there with forests and with wood. So when we look at that opportunity to store carbon in the forest, it, this is the kind of chart you often will see with forest carbon flows. And what it's showing is over time, the increase in the fluctuations in carbon storage in the forest. And so in the forest, we have carbon stored in the soils. We have this carbon you know, in the leaves and branches and some of the things on the forest floor or in that, that understory of the forest. And then there's carbon that's stored in the trees. And as from young trees, as those trees grow, there's more carbon stored. And then if those trees are harvested or there's a wildfire or some other event that, that causes that carbon to be removed from the forest, then that carbon storage goes down until the trees regrow again, and then an event might occur and the trees regrow. So what this is showing on any individual forest, you know, smaller unit, you know, management unit or, or stand of trees that over time, the carbon storage in that forest is, is fluctuating as trees grow, as disturbance occurs, as harvests occur, whatever it might be. And that's understanding that cycle of carbon is part of what we can manage within our forestry system. But we also have to make sure we keep in mind the fact that um, forest carbon storage occurs across the landscape. And that much of that carbon storage is very stable on an annual basis. So to understand that, this, these, these three images are just to help us think of the landscape scale of forest, forest carbon storage. So this first image is just like what I showed you. Young trees growing older, storing more carbon as they get bigger, and then they're harvested or there's something that happens and the, the forest has to regrow and this cycle continues. And that would, would be the way to think of it on an individual forest stand and maybe over a 20, 50, 60 year period that these kind of things would occur. But if we zoom out and we look at, you know, maybe it's a county 
or a, a watershed or something like that. And the reality is that on any given time period, only a small part of that landscape and any given year, only a small part is impacted by some event. Even if there's a wildfire, you know, wildfires will behave in a patchy way. Timber harvests, you know, occur just in, in a spotty way on the landscape. And so if we zoom out even further and we really look at the U.S. or we look at a state, then what we really see is that the bulk of that forest resource on an annual basis is, is just growing. It's not being impacted by something that is, that is diminishing the carbon storage. And this, this last image here is really pretty representative of what is happening in the U.S. right now. On an annual basis, less than 2% of our forest resource is impacted by harvesting or something that is going to diminish the carbon storage. So on a, on a national basis, our forest carbon storage is pretty darn stable. Some people would say it's, there, are, there are certainly indications where that forest carbon storage is increasing. And if you look at a smaller scale in certain counties or something like this, you, you can maybe find some minor decreases. But on the nation as a whole, it's fair to say that the bulk of our forest carbon storage is really stable. It really represents a savings account um, in, in, a, in a pretty significant scale. And it's important to recognize that because it really, like I said, that, that carbon storage in forests, it, it's just not as, you know, the first image always makes it look like it's a roller coaster or something, but you really have to understand that at the, at the large scale, at the ecological scale of forests, there is an entire base of forest carbon storage that is very stable. And as I mentioned with, you know, what the experts have found when they look at this is, you know, storing carbon in forests is one thing. And that's, again, this slide showing that same thing with those trees growing and, and this cycle of storing carbon in the forest. But the second opportunity that we have is to take material from that forest and manufacture wood products and to store carbon. That's what this, this section here is showing is taking material from that forest and storing carbon in those wood products in our built environment. Because trees, whether they're standing in the forest or they're holding up the walls of your home, trees, wood, it's, it's about half carbon by weight. So if you had, you know, that's, that's wood is, is, is half carbon. Um, you can, I, I always I hesitate to say that because the wood scientists I talk to will say, well, you know, you have to qualify species that vary between like 0.48 you know, you know, 48% carbon to those that are like 52%, whatever. There is variability, um, but the rule of thumb is wood is about half carbon. And so when you, whether that tree is in the forest or holding up, like I said, the walls of your home, it is, it's storing carbon. And then the third opportunity we have when we do that, when we store carbon in the forest, store carbon in our wood products, is we can use wood products instead of other higher emitting materials and we can avoid the carbon emissions, the pollution, the environmental impacts of those materials. And that's what this, this other part of the map shows, is by using this wood, you can avoid potentially using concrete and the emissions associated with concrete. Now we know that the built environment requires all material, wood, steel, concrete, they all have a place in the built environment. But what climate scientists are telling us is to think creatively about how we use wood and where we have the opportunities to harness those carbon storage benefits. Because for every 10,000 cubic feet of wood that we use, it stores about the same amount of carbon dioxide as taking 50 cars off the road. And this stat focuses on non-residential structures in large part because that's where we have the growth opportunity. It's quite common in the U.S. already to build residential homes out of wood, and we have a lot of carbon storage already within that part of our environment, but there's a growth opportunity within our commercial uh, and non-residential environment. So when we connect this back to the forest resources, especially in the West and the wildfire risk, a big part of that is connecting back to the restoration needs in this country. It's been estimated that um, about, and this is just on uh, federal forest service lands, but about 65 to 82 million acres of forest in the United States need restoration activities. What this means is really work uh, to remove dead and dying trees, reduce wildfire risk, improve biodiversity, improve wildlife habitats and water qualities, but actions that we would take in our stewardship and management to enhance the resiliency and functionality of those ecosystems. With current uh, budgets, 
The Forest Service is able to accomplish about four to five million acres of restoration each year. From those four or five million acres um, that the Forest Service is treating each year, they're removing the equivalent of about 1.2 billion board feet of timber. It, there's an investment of over $660 million in labor and the creation of more than 4,000 jobs. So there's, there's a tremendous restoration need in America's forest because of fire suppression and past history and some of the things that have gone on in our forest. There's a tremendous restoration need to improve resiliency. We're able to get a little bit of it done right now because we're mainly having to pay for it in many regions where restoration is occurring, there are not strong enough markets to utilize the material that's coming from these forests. So we're having to pay uh, service providers to do the restoration. But even from the, the, the few million of acres that we're able to do each year, we can see the magnitude of impact and economic uh, your job creation and, and materials that could come from a more robust restoration effort. And if we look at what restoration typically means in the western U.S., these are the typical kind of before and after pictures that we see. You know, a dense forest on the top that is more prone to wildfire risk and, and more of a public safety risk, reduced value for wildlife, and may even have some water quality issues as the understory, uh, or as the soils in the forest floor are less protected by vegetation. And then the after picture where there's thinning and there's removal to reduce wildfire risk and to enhance some of the other benefits. Now, one of the questions that people always have is, you know, when is, when is clear cutting appropriate or is clear cutting bad, this kind of thing? And when we look at restoration activities and forest management activities, there's a whole spectrum of intensity that we talk about within forest management. So these pictures are showing a fairly modest level of intensity where maybe, you know, half of the trees are being removed, a little more, a little less, but somewhere in that ballpark. There are other restoration activities where all of these trees would be removed. There are times where the goal of ecological restoration is to create meadow habitat or to remove trees that are encroaching into other important prairie habitats, this kind of thing. So for ecological reasons, there can be motivations that would, would call for a much higher level of tree removal than what you see in these pictures. And similarly with forest management, if, even if it's not necessarily for a restoration opportunity, but it, it's really to en enhance forest development and forest growth, there's times where more intensive methods of harvesting, you know, whether you, people call it clear cutting, regeneration harvest is another term, but when that is used to favor certain tree species that really need full sun in those kinds of conditions to thrive. So we see in forest management and even in restoration, a spectrum of intensities in, that's designed to meet those goals. So I mentioned that, you know, this, the restoration that we're doing, you know, 1.2 billion board feet of timber, and to put that in perspective, you know, this is just an example of an apartment project, requires 2.3 billion board feet, you know, it's, it's 244 units. I mean, just an example, just your typical kind of, you know, big apartment project. With the amount of material just coming from about 5 million acres of restoration, we could build more than 500 of these apartment buildings each year. Just from that small amount of land and that small amount of restoration that we're accomplishing. I don't want to, uh, you know, it, it's significant restoration, but it's certainly not all of the restoration that we could be doing in this country. And this isn't always a fair comparison because the material coming from those restoration projects, a lot of it is not high enough quality to produce timber. So this is not, you know, exactly an equivalent kind of thing. But just to give you a sense of the scale of the material that we're talking about and how this can directly relate to utilization in the built environment. The other key thing about that is the, always the concern is that, well, if we start using more wood, building with more wood, you know, are we going to over harvest our forest? And I, I completely relate to that concern. You know, I, I work in the field of forestry. I care deeply about the health of our forest. And so this is, I think, important perspective as well in terms of, I think it's really hard to fully grasp the volume of wood material that we have in the United States. So the net annual growth in U.S. forest, and that's net growth, that subtracts out mortality, wildfires, this is net annual growth in U.S. forests. It's nearly double our annual removal. On an annual basis in this country, the net annual growth is about 215 billion board feet. We harvest a little over 100 billion board feet each year. That leaves more than 100 billion board feet that we're not tapping into right now. And so, 
I am not advocating that we double our harvest rates or anything like that. All I want you to understand is that there is a lot of available wood on the landscape that we're not fully utilizing. And that some part of that is good for ecology, but another part of that is contributing to wildfire risk, increased tree mortality, public safety issues, and also diminished economic opportunities in some of our most forest dependent regions. So there is a significant amount of wood that is available to support our goals for climate change, carbon storage in our built environment, economic development goals, as well as environmental restoration goals. So just to be clear about the, the, the volume of material that really is available in this country. So as I said, we can store carbon in the forest, we can store carbon in our built environment, and that really is a way to create win-win. The last thing, I couldn't let you go without, you know, more numbers and decimal points or something like that. I just want to touch very briefly on life cycle assessment. This is another key component of understanding sustainability. This is life cycle assessment data comparing wood and steel and really looking at the difference. And we oftentimes talk about carbon, carbon dioxide, climate change, but it is also important to recognize that different materials have all kinds of other environmental impacts in terms of emissions and effluents, whether it's to air or to water or uh, you know, disposal needs with those materials. And as shown in this image, in this data, steel has you know, 1.6 to 41 times the impact of wood across these measurable impact indicators. And there are many different LCAs you can look at to get insight into these differences, but these are fundamentally different materials, and so the environmental impacts are fundamentally different. And as I said before, our built environment requires the use of all kinds of different materials, but we need to think carefully about the choices that we make in those materials. This is another way of looking at um, aggregating some of the life cycle assessment information. We're looking at embodied energy impacts, global warming potential, air, water emissions, these kinds of things. And again, you can see that the impacts of steel are significantly higher across these categories. The exception being solid waste. Research has shown that oftentimes at construction sites, there is more wood waste um, generated from trimming and just different things that happen at construction sites when it comes to uh, wood waste. And so we do see that wood doesn't perform as well in that category in at least some studies. So at the end of the day, wood products, they are such an important part of our built environment and they perform so well as a sustainable building material because they are renewable, reusable, biodegradable, they store carbon, you know, and many of the other things I talked about in terms of coming from our ecology and our natural environment. And so with that, um, this is the resource I would direct you to if you're looking for more insight into the U.S. forest and just more of that history and kind of where we are today. The Forest Service and the U.S. Endowment for Forestry and Communities have a wonderful interactive guide to the America's forest. And with that, um, I would be happy to, to take any questions uh, and, and ask for your help with that, Karen. Thank you, Katie. Excellent presentation. I wanted to just add in quickly with regard to the handouts um, that were available during the session today. As Katie mentioned, she added a few additional slides, and so we'll be sure to update the handout to include those new slides uh, when we post the Q&A summary and the recorded uh, session shortly in the next couple of weeks. Uh, but let's get to the questions. Uh, just to start with a, an interesting one. Is the first question that came in, it said, uh, just curious, did the wood buildings in the background survive the 35 years? So if you think back to the beginning of the session, Katie, with the the photos you were showing from Washington State and um, a curious question by one of our attendees. Yeah, you can see by that last picture that they, they, they're they barely standing, the forest took over. But, um, it, and it's interesting because that is indicative of an era when we would set up logging camps. And there are parts of the country where historical societies have preserved those logging camps, gone back in, you know, to, to resurrect that. But in most areas, they've, they've, they've gone into the forest floor and, and not been preserved. Great, and then another question uh, from early on in the session. Uh, it, the question is the stats that you shared regarding forest management in the US, are they similar in Canada? It, 
Some of the stats are similar, but not all of them. Uh, in Canada, across the entire country, there's a much stronger dominance of public land ownership than private land ownership. So that's dramatically different in terms of ownership, public versus private. It's almost opposite in Canada in terms of public dominance. Um, in, but in terms of forest cover, like I said, the U.S. has over 70% of that forest area growing trees. Canada is a little over 90% of their potential ecological capacity growing trees. And then as you saw from the ecological map, Canada is dominated by boreal forests and, it, and not quite the same diversity it, it, or the same, you know, it, there's a little bit of difference in the ecology. But uh, in terms of the economic relationship with the forest, the wildfire risks in Western Canada, you, you know, those kinds of things are, are similar. So important differences, but, but there are parallels as well. Thank you. Let's see, um, another question. How much of the U.S. lumber currently comes from sustainable, sustainably managed forests? So it's a, I would argue almost all of it would be my position on that question. And the way I would describe that is when we look globally at how we define sustainability in terms of uh, illegality or illegal logging, uh, you know, risk of those kinds of practices, North America performs very well. We're, at, we're in the, at the very top in terms of not only strong forest protection laws, but enforcement of those laws as well. And then if we look at the abundance of our forest, the resilience of that forest, the amount of forest area, the amount of protected area, the natural biodiversity, the U.S. and North America, U.S. and Canada also perform very well. And then lastly, if we look at really the economic kind of sustainability and some of the social considerations in terms of our, our businesses reinvesting in the forest landscape, some of those indicators of sustainability, again, we perform very well. So personally, that would be my answer, is the vast majority of wood harvested in the U.S. and Canada, I consider coming from sustainably managed forests. I, I, I don't say 100% because I recognize Things can happen, bad things can happen in, in certain situations. But we do have the regulatory structure, the professional science-based forest management systems within our, our training and our, our practice, our, our research and education institutions. And then we have the monitoring in place across the landscape as well from the Forest Service, state agencies, and others that have responsibility for managing that. If the question is much more about certification as a, as a measure of sustainability, it's the amount of certified forest land in the U.S. is less than 30% of the landscape. And a big reason it's very difficult for us to go much further than that is because of our federal ownership and our private land ownership in terms of the barriers for those ownerships to get certified. But I've, you know, I've worked in forestry more than 22 years, and I'm, I'm, I, I'm very proud of what we do to manage our forest sustainably. Great. Very comprehensive answer. Thanks, Katie. And a lot of questions are coming in right now. We'll certainly go through them all um, after the fact. I, I want to get as many questions answered as we can in another minute or so. Um, and you started to touch on this. So a question came in that says, how can the info presented be included toward lead certification or similar? And I think you, you started to touch on that topic, Katie. So if you could answer that. Yeah, I, you know, LEED has been evolving. I mean, back in the early days, they really only recognized FST certification. A few years ago, LEED put in an alternative pathway uh, for recognizing legal, responsible, and certified sources and really recognizing the diversity of certification op options that are out there, as well as recognizing the importance of eliminating illegal materials from the, from the supply chain. So I think LEED is on the pathway to really um, understanding the, the complexity and the opportunity to really embrace the benefits of using wood. But I think it is important to have more of these conversations um, to make sure that wood is, 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 like I said, really embraced as a building material of choice within green building. And we're not quite there yet, but I was very encouraged when LEED did introduce that alternative pathway credit. Right. Um, let's the, I know we really are running against the clock here. So one question, um, are pine beetles having a significant impact on available wood resources? It, 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 that's a long answer. It, it, it's one of those things where <laughs> they, are impact, they are impacting the forest and where there are strong markets, we can still use dead and dying trees. Where there are weak markets, 
that will not accept dead wood is a big problem. So it's a, it's a complicated issue and people are having to respond to the, the complexities of that issue. Right, we'll have to set up another webinar for that question alone. Um, and uh, I think that again comes back to the, the a lot of the discussion you had at the beginning with the, looking at the ecological and, and responsible management that we are um, taking on. So there was, a, I guess, one last question to end it with is, would you consider wood to be the most sustainable building material? Well, I think you all know by now that I, I love wood, so it's hard for me not just to say, of course, but, but I do, the so wood, wood has just these unique attributes that make it very special. So if you want a yes, no answer, my answer is yes. But as I said before, we couldn't build everything we need only out of wood. So we have to find the right interaction between these different materials. So I think wood, if you look at the data for the last 50 or 60 years, we haven't even been increasing our use of wood in pace with population growth. I'll say that again, at the, the rate that our population has been increasing globally for the last 60 years, we aren't even increasing our use of wood to keep pace with population growth. If you look at the last 60 years, we've increased our use of plastics, steel, and concrete, but especially plastics and steel at a much higher rate than population growth. So wood is uniquely sustainable. We're gonna to have to use all kinds of materials. Let's try and think of wood first and be innovative about it. Thank you, Katie. Um, as we conclude, I just want to remind um, all attendees three quick things regarding the short survey, CEUs, and upcoming webinars. We'd really appreciate your feedback via the survey that you will receive shortly, so please take a minute and fill that out. Don't forget to download the AIA or ICC Certificate of Completion from the links in the follow-up email that you'll be receiving shortly as well. And finally, make sure that you're signed up to receive our APA update newsletter so that you will be notified of our next webinar as well as future webinars and updates to APA publications and standards. To receive it, all you need to do is starting from the homepage of our website is to click on sign in in the upper right hand corner of the page. In the menu that drops down, simply select register. From there, you'll need to let us know what you'd specifically like to receive, which in this case is the APA update newsletter. I should mention that if you have technical questions on any topic related to the use of engineered wood products, don't hesitate to contact the APA help desk at the address shown here. We also have APA field staff available to assist design professionals, builders, and code officials, and their individual contact information can be found on our APA website, apawood.org. As mentioned earlier, a recording of today's webinar, a PDF of the slides, and answers to the questions that were asked will be posted at apawood.org in a week or two. And with that, I'd like to thank you for attending. Have a great day.